Enjoy with your headphones for a better listening experience. Please watch till the end of the video to have the most scariest of the stories. What's a horrifying slash creepy experience you have lived through? Serious? 26. I'm a cybersecurity guy for hire and have done a lot of work that was pretty messy, but this is one of the more immoral slash messed up ones. A few years back I did some work with the Kurdish Peshmerga in Iraq as a favor for an old friend who grew up there. Around when I was working, ISIS had stepped up their counterintelligence and intelligence game, with the thanks of the Turkish government's helping hands, and began to take the smartphones off of killed friendly combatants. I wasn't made aware of this until a month before I went back home. Some easily made countermeasures were put in place, and the fighting carried on as per usual, albeit more demoralizing with having to verify everyone you talked to wasn't face to face. After that stint I resumed my mostly normal life, when a dude hit me up from back then about a year later. I ran into him a couple times while I was doing my favor for said friend, and he was a very nice dude and a good poet, so we got to chat a bit to see how he was. He was really curious to what everyone else was up to, about which I didn't really know, or didn't bother to go into any detail of those who I did know about. A few weeks later I had a call with said old friend and brought up the person. My friend got pretty quiet and through the call relayed how the person was killed and his body went missing after they tried to recover him once the fight was over. Apparently they used his body's biometrics to unlock the phone and were messaging anyone related to the Peshmerga in the hopes of getting an information leak. It was unnerving at the time to realize that, and I still think about it from time to time. 27. My sister has been telling me for years that something would happen to her in 2020. For years. She had a little girl in 2017 and insisted she had the baby for me. I have no kids. 2019 our father dies and they were not on good terms. My mother died estranged from her and that has to suck. I on the other hand took care of both of my parents. COVID-19 happens, her son was then sexually assaulted. In April, my uncle's baby brother and probably one of the best men in the world died. We were devastated. In June, we began to notice her odd behaviors. Within a week began the most destructive and stunning downward spiral. I had to remove my nephews from her residence. She was in what we now know was a manic episode. Before all this, she was incredibly bright but the most stubborn person alive. So, her heightened level made her completely unwilling to seek any help. We had her committed several times and nothing worked. She has been arrested and jailed, committed by the police as well. We are still attempting to help her, but her condition has deteriorated in such a way that we know she may not survive. She lives in a world completely separate from us now. The worst part? She has posted everything on Facebook since June. To see her deteriorating through those posts is horrifying. It scares me because our brother has the same mental health issues. It's incredibly terrifying how quickly our mind can turn on us. 28. A few years back, I ate really old fish. It was herring in vinegar so the fact that it was long gone wasn't as obvious. It didn't quite taste right but my mom kept saying it's fine and that I should just eat it. So, I did. Several hours later my head gets a little dizzy and I need to lie down. I sleep through the night, wake up the next morning still not feeling good. Now I'm starting to feel really sick and don't eat or drink anything. But I push through the day, thinking I'll get better with rest. I wake up the next morning, throwing up, the world is spinning as if I just drank two bottles of vodka. Mom takes me to the hospital, but it takes a long time. I have severe food poisoning and am dehydrated. I haven't had any water in over 30 hours. I can't stop throwing up and am just leaning out the car window to do that as we drive to a hospital. My hands and legs start cramping up, I can't even use my neck muscles to support my head anymore, it's just hanging loose out the window. I can barely talk I've never been so sick in my entire life and at that point I realized. I'm going to die. It was such an odd feeling. My brain went, okay, this is it. This is how it ends. I fully believed I was dying that day and there's nothing that can be done anymore. The scariest part was that rather than being scared, I took it as a relief. I knew this suffering was ending and it made me calm. I was very accepting of it. 
which are what scares me the most today. To just come to terms with it and not try to save myself any more spoiler alert, I survived mom drove me to the hospital, where I got in four to rehydrate. I spent the next four days throwing up constantly. Then slowly started being able to walk around again for a few minutes a day. I was released a week later, but I was dizzy for around two more weeks afterwards. Would stumble when walking, especially when getting out of the shower with wet hair, the extra weight of the water was making me lose my balance and I'd fall down because of it sometimes. 29. Getting abused by a 30-year-old when I was 15-16 was probably the worst. He screwed with my head so bad I almost believed it was normal. He'd always say you can't rape the willing, as he poured alcohol down my throat. I was in Vegas when I was maybe 22 waiting for someone outside the bathrooms in an empty part of a casino. Some guy pushed me against the wall and kept telling me how beautiful I was while trying to drag me towards the exit. He had pulled me about 20 feet, and I was trying hard to get away. I don't know why I didn't scream. We were only about four feet from the door when the guy I was with came out of the bathroom and was scared he would be abductor away. Another 30 seconds, and I would have been gone. There are more, but that's probably enough. 30. When I was 20, I was visiting my neighbor and helping with a project when his three-year-old came around the corner with a bad head injury. She had fallen off her kitty swing and hit the back of her head on a rock. While her parents were wrapping her wound up and getting into the car, I called 911 and informed the operator of the injury and what hospital they were going to. Even told them what model of car so they could inform police about why they would be speeding. I still get chills every time I think about it. There was so much blood. It's a particular kind of sinking feeling to know that there's nothing you can do when someone's severely injured. 31. Nice, I've been meaning to tell this story on Reddit for a while. I apologize for the length of my retelling, I've never been known for being concise. Back in June, my boyfriend and I went camping at a spot we have been to many times. It is pretty remote, and campsites were far apart, so sites were like 400 feet apart and there were trees blocking their view. No service, no ranger station within like 30 minutes of driving. It's also bear country, so I kept my bear spray on my hip. My boyfriend informs me that he forgot our gun at home, he didn't see the box sitting out with our stuff to pack, so all we have is bear spray. So, my boyfriend and I have a nice evening, and go to sleep with our dog in our tent. My Subaru is parked perpendicular to the opening of the tent, kind of forming a barrier in front of our sight. I wake up while it's still dark to my boyfriend whispering sharply at me. Get the bear spray now. I am still 90% asleep and I go, oh shit, is there a bear? I rip my bear spray out of the holster. I was actually pretty excited to see a bear. What my boyfriend said next made my stomach drop. No, it's a person. My boyfriend later tells me that he had awoken to the sound of a door handle jiggling. He and the dog stared at each other quizzically, then he opened the zipper on the tent to look out. The front of our tent is open a tiny bit and I can see it's just before dawn. My boyfriend is a very gentle, quiet man. That's why the bellowing that he made following him alerting me was so scary. He just starts yelling, get out of here. Go. I was like, did I mishear him? Definitely sounds like he's yelling at an animal. I have our little 40-pound whippet mix clutched in my arms. She is shaking and cowering, not a guard dog. I stick my head out the tent alongside my boyfriend. I see my car about 10 feet in front of our tent, and crouched beside it is a huge man, all in black. He seems to be hiding, very poorly, behind my car. My boyfriend continues to yell at him, and the guy won't budge. The guy then stands and just stares at us. He is extremely close and there is no one around. And this guy heard us say to get the bear spray, so he probably knows we don't have a gun. I stick the bear spray out the tent door. Disclaimer, I am a 5 feet 4 inches white girl, but I have a pretty hot temper, so maybe I was convincing? And I shout, do you want to get bear sprayed? At this guy in my scariest voice. He finally starts to back away, slowly. He doesn't appear armed, at least that I can tell. 
But God, this guy was just scary. Something about his body language just screamed, I know you can't stop me if I really wanted to come at you right now. My boyfriend is pretty tough, but he's not that big of a man, and this intruder is a monster, at least six feet three inches and bulky. So, this guy finally is backing off and takes off walking down the road. My boyfriend and I immediately jumped into action, stuffing all our gear into the car, along with the dog. We got everything torn down in 15 minutes, all the while watching this man stumble up the road. He is walking with this unsettling swaying motion, swinging his arms to the side and kind of waddling. I am a nurse, and I have worked with a lot of people on a lot of different drugs. I am sure this guy was on meth, based on his body language, thinking he was hidden when he absolutely was not, and the way he acted so confrontational like he could just square up to us. I'm watching this guy walking down the road, and he disappears into the brush for a minute. We finish getting everything ready to go, and I do something stupid. I ran to the end of the campsite to see where he is, leaving my boyfriend 20 feet away at the car. He yells at me to come back, just as I see the guy walking back dragging a big ASS branch behind him. He is about 10 feet from me when I see him. I left my bear spray in the car in my panic, and I am totally unarmed. I back away toward the car, and this man stops right in front of me, positioned in the entrance to our site. He stares at me and gives me this look that still gives me chills, I can't really explain it, but it was just sinister. He then, without breaking eye contact, drops the branch so that we can't get out of the campsite without moving it. He then just keeps walking down the road, then cuts into the forest and starts heading behind our site. I ran full speed to grab my dog, who is tied to a tree at the back of the site, terrified that at any moment a bunch of meth head psychos are going to come out of the bushes behind the site and grab me. Who knows if he had friends somewhere and he was just the scout. I was not going to stick around to find out. I grab my dog and throw her in the car, she is trembling like a leaf, and so am I. My boyfriend jumps out of the car and throws the branch out of the way. We drove off down the road to the right from where the guy came up the road with the branch. Along the whole way up the road, there are more branches and logs placed in the road, making it more difficult for us to get out. But it wasn't a real effort, it was kind of like a delusional way of placing obstacles, like he thought it would really slow us down, but we were able to just drive around the debris, or my boyfriend quickly jumped out to throw stuff out of the way. This is another reason he seemed like he was on drugs. As we drove down the road from the campsite, we blared our horn to wake up anyone who might be sleeping so they aren't also surprised by this creep. We got out and sped down the gravel road toward the fishing shop, looking for a ranger station. There isn't a single one. We drive all the way back to the highway and finally get a signal and call 911. They get a description and say they'll send an officer, but I knew they wouldn't give any effort to really catch the guy. I have no idea what happened in the end or who that guy was. I have no idea what his intentions were beyond just jiggling our door handle to try to steal. Luckily we are smart campers and got all our shit locked in the car before bed. But God, that look he gave me, I see it in my nightmares. Why wouldn't he just leave? Most thieves book it as soon as you see them, but this guy seemed predatory. My boyfriend and I will never forget our gun again. 32. When I was 19, my father's divorce, because the fights were violent, once my mother pushed my father and he collapsed, my mother almost run to his job, but my father wake and he threatened my mother with a knife, he didn't something evil, because a fought with him like in Breaking Bad, scratch me, but my mother could run. That was the most horrifying experience in my life, my mother never sees my father again, my father dies six months ago, and I should go to therapist. 33. When I was around 13 I had a tendency to stay up late and try to beat my current N64 game of choice over a weekend. One night I had decided to move my stuff to the living room, now keep in mind our house had a hallway connected to the bedrooms, but the hallway had a door for some reason, so after moving everything to the living room I closed the door for the hallway to not wake up anyone, about two hours into my gaming session I started hearing tapping noises, so I paused my game and the noises stopped. Then, for 10 minutes, it got louder, yet this time coming from the sliding glass door in the den. 
At this point, I ran to get my dad. He ran out of his room and went out back only to see someone jump the fence. Turned out that a local mental hospital had an escape early that evening, according to the police who arrived. What was more creepy was the glass on the window was very close to breaking. I never once played video games in the living room again, and now I suffer from night terrors and a severe fear of looking out windows or doors at night. 34. When I gave birth to my son by C-section, my nurse on shift forgot to refill my morphine drip in the hours after my surgery. So, my pain meds completely wore off exposing me to the full pain of having had my abdomen sliced open and I absolutely panicked. The pain was excruciating. I had to lay there suffering while my nurse went to get more for the drip which took quite a while. The only thing I knew to do was breathe the same way I would in natural childbirth, which I had already experienced, to keep me from passing out from the pain. That experience left me traumatized for a while. 35. In 2017 I had recently dropped out of college because I was so depressed. I started hanging out with friends that seemed like good friends, but really just enabled my worst habits and impulses. We started doing a lot of drugs, LSD, ecstasy, painkillers. We had developed the delusion that if we did these things safely, there was nothing to worry about, meanwhile our bodies were being destroyed. Eventually, after months of it getting worse, and worse I accidentally overdosed on ecstasy. I was home alone. I knew it was happening well before it got really bad. I was straight up panicking, couldn't even stand up, because everything would go blurry and purple. For some reason, I cannot fathom, I called an Uber to take me to the ER. This poor Uber driver drove this dying teenager to the hospital. Anyway, they wheel me into a room, and this is when it got really bad. They hook me up to in four, a bunch of doctors are asking me questions I can't answer. Their voices sound farther and farther away, becoming muffled. I can't see anything except whiteness from the bright fluorescent lights. My body is shaking violently like I'm having a seizure, I'm not sure if it was the worst anxiety attack ever or something else. My heart felt like it was going to burst, I could barely breathe, I couldn't move, couldn't even close my hand to a fist. My muscles felt like pop rocks, nerves firing rapidly. My skin hurt, I was hot and cold. All the while, my mind was all there. I had never been so terrified, so alone. I truly felt like I was going to die in this awful room, and my family was going to hear about it and it would destroy their lives. It was my worst nightmare coming true. It was at this moment I knew I didn't want to die, I'm not religious, but I desperately begged the universe to let me live. I just wanted to be home with my family. Eventually, I realized I wasn't in pain anymore. My white vision had turned black, my body felt fine, and I was breathing. I was asleep. But I still heard the doctor's muffled voices. One of them did something to my four, and I remember her telling me she would check on me a little bit. I remember mumbling, wait. She asked if I needed anything, and I just asked her to stay. I still felt like I was going to slip away and die at any second. I told her I didn't want to die alone. I heard a chair slide across the floor, and then I felt her hand in mine. She held my hand until I really fell asleep. I never even saw her face or got to say thank you. When I woke up I was okay, and they sent me home. I eventually told my mom what had happened, then my dad, and later on my sisters. I'm closer to my family than ever, I'm in better shape than I've ever been, I'm still depressed, but so much better than I was. 36. A few years ago, I was sleeping then all of a sudden I woke up, then started hearing sounds in my room. It's kinda hard to explain, but something like the sound of your furniture when you put something on it. Or like the sound it makes during an earthquake? Like that. In this case, I was hearing it all around my room, like there was something jumping across everywhere. I was terrified, lol, I was aware something was happening, but I was too scared to peek around, at this point I was hiding under my blanket. Eventually, the sound stopped, and I gained enough courage to stick out my arm and reach my phone which was on my nightstand. I turn it on and notice it's, steamed, like, it had condensation all over the screen. 
Nothing else seemed out of place after that, and I had a really tough time going to sleep again that night. It was definitely not sleeping paralysis since I could move normally, just that I was stiff from the terror alone. Now that I think about it, there's a possibility it could have been an animal, like a rat, running across the roof, though I don't know how to explain why it sounded like it was inside my room, and what made my phone get like that. 37. My father was deployed with the UN in Sierra Leone during the Civil War two decades ago. If you know anything about the subject, I'm sure you can imagine what would happen to a man after seeing the things that went on there. While I was growing up, my father wasn't an alcoholic or addict, but something inside him had snapped. He did a good job of covering it up, but when he was angry it was truly something else. On one specific occasion I was being a miserable child, as 11 years olds do, and he grabbed my neck and screamed at me about how he had taken the lives of countless men in Africa, how he had witnessed and killed child soldiers younger than me, how my life could be snuffed out for being an ungrateful to him. Worst of all, even though this was in anger, he said all these things with pride. He told me that he was three times the man I'd ever be. I still remember the date, February 15, 2014, because I thought I'd one day prove him wrong. Took me a long time to understand that I wasn't the one at fault for what he said. 38. My alcoholic brother went into a rage and my entire family had to hold him down. My mother punched him in the face because he wouldn't stop cursing the family and saying awful things. It doesn't sound special, but I remember in the moment thinking how bizarre my life was. It was an otherwise normal family that was holding my brother down with police officers on the way. I had a panic attack an hour later when my body finally caught up with what had happened. I'm not that type of person who can't take stuff. My whole body shut down. 39. I have an incredibly abusive older brother that has terrorized me for years. He has a really bad temper, and you don't know what'll set him off. One time when I was about 9 or 10, I said something that set him off and he chased me into the bathroom, luckily I locked the door in time, but then he started banging the door telling me that if I don't open the door to let him beat me up, he would get the door open anyway and beat me up even more. There was a tiny window so I climbed out of that onto a tiny ledge of our apartment on the fourth floor so I could then climb in through the kitchen and out the apartment, but he must have figured it out, so he ran into the kitchen and told me to stay out on the ledge or he'd beat me up. I ended up staying on that ledge for what felt like eternity before my mom came home and I was safe. I decided a while back to cut contact with him, I hadn't spoken to him in years, but he'd contact me every now and then and I finally told him off because he said he didn't need to apologize for anything because he's made peace with his past, and even though I've told my mom the full extent of all the things he's done to be over the years, my mom continually tells me to forgive him because family is family, but I'm actually much happier now without him looming over me so I don't think I will. 40. All throughout my childhood whenever I slept in my parents' room I had to have the door to their closet shut. If it weren't shut I would see shadowy figures wall through the door, they would disappear if I shut my eyes for a minute, but yeah it was pretty creepy. Fast forward to high school and we have redone our house and a corner of my room now takes up where that closet door used to be. My junior year of high school we got a new dog. This dog would sleep everywhere in my house, except my room. Whenever he was in my room at night he would stand in the center of my room, stare at the corner that the closet was once in and whimper. I could not get him to calm down unless I let him out of my room. During this time, I would also hear scratching coming from this corner, which I know people might say it could be a mouse in the wall or a bird or something, but these scratches were distinctly different from the sound nice make. They also sounded like a much larger thing was making them. The sounds have since stopped and I hope they don't come back. I'm sure I'm missing some stuff, I'll add it if I remember it. 41. When I was 10 coming back from Guadalupe, our DC-10 of AOM Airlines hit some cumulonimbus head during the night and literally stalled sideways for several thousand feet. Everyone was asleep and completely taken by surprise since the flight was so calm until that moment. I hit my head on the baggage compartment since I did not have my seatbelt on, but thankfully no injury. I was dead scared for my life, and I only have memory flashes of people screaming and of my mother's face holding me down onto my seat with an impassable expression. We eventually resumed level flight until Paris in the morning. I don't have any recollection of how I felt for the rest of the flight. 
My kid's fascination for airplanes completely yielded to severe aerophobia until that pre-9-11 day when a nice British Airways 737 captain invited me in the flight deck after a flight attendant told him there was a scared kid in the back who was on that flight from a couple of months ago. He gave me the pep talk, the complete tour of the instruments and systems and had me stay for landing. That cured me instantly. Luckily, a kid's fear is like clay. You can reshape it before it sets for life. 42. Creepy Experience Back in the early 90s when I was a kid our family home had a driveway with a gate between two large stone eagle statues. This was a sleepy small town in Yorkshire. It was a quiet area, you'd see a vehicle on the road maybe twice an hour. One morning we awoke to discover that one of the eagles was missing. Not only that but there was no damage done, it was a perfectly smooth cut and there was no debris left behind. Also, the gate wasn't far from the house in a quiet area. Yet nobody heard anything. Weird. Almost a week later the neighbor from down the road visits and tells us that he's found our eagle at the bottom of his skip. So, he returned it and it's pretty much in perfect condition. Perfectly smooth removal. More weirdness. Then a few days later I'm alone in my room, sitting on the windowsill that overlooks the front of the house when I see a black stretch limousine turn the corner and come down our road. Not something you'd expect to see in the middle of the afternoon. So, I watched it. It parked up right outside of our gate. And then this guy gets out. He looks like something from the early 20th century. Like an old-fashioned driver, with one of those driver's hats, which he took off upon exiting his car, and gloves on. He looks bald too, not even eyebrows. He walked over to the post that had the eagle on top of it and he ran his hand over the smooth bump. Looks around for a while and then gets back into the limousine and drives away. I can still picture it today, one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. 43, a few years ago I had a relationship with a girl who literally went from waking up in the morning and just sitting in her bed in tears of joy because she was convinced I was her soulmate, planning her future with me, meeting my parents, and having her think she was lovely, to essentially just waking up one day and losing all feelings practically overnight. No explanation or even any desire to explore why, and I got the impression she didn't even understand why herself. Just an incredibly haunting moment of acceptance, like she just knew and had to go with it. The fact that this is even possible within the human condition honestly terrifies me. She was so completely convinced we were meant to be, too. She was always looking ahead towards our future together, right down to details like how she wanted to have a pet fish when we moved in together one day. Then just, nothing. 44. When I was about 9 years old, I went to the park near my house with my older sister, 17, and her boyfriend, 18 or 19. My sister and her boyfriend were walking around the track while I played on the playground there. It was early evening slash dusk, so I was the only one on the playground. After 10 minutes or so a middle-aged man walked up and started talking to me. Can't remember the exact things he was saying and asking me but I do remember him slowly getting closer and closer to me. I was on a platform with one of those bridges connected to it and he was on the ground at the other end of the bridge at first and slowly made it to the platform. My sister and her boyfriend came into view on the track about the time I started getting nervous and he asked if it was my parents. They were still a little way away so I doubt he could tell how young they were. I said no, that it was my sister and her boyfriend and he hurriedly said goodbye and left. I can't say for sure that anything would have happened had they not come around then, but I'm sure glad that they did. 45. I lived in Cairo for a year and a half. The middle of 2012 to the end of 2013. I was studying at the American University in Cairo. It's a difficult place to live, but I'm pretty adaptable and was able to understand everyday aspects of living there as well as the basic geography of Cairo. Basic is relative, because look at a map and there seems to be no urban planning to Cairo. So, towards the end of my time in Egypt my sister came to visit me. We went to the pyramids, it was my second time to go, we went to Jordan to see Petra, amazing. 
When we were back in Cairo we went to Zamalek for dinner I think and got a taxi to my apartment that was in Daki. I had been in numerous taxis until this point. I had gotten screwed on cash a few times but had never had a truly awful experience. Admittedly it was because I am a man. Now it's important to know that technically Cairo is to the east of the Nile and Giza is to the west, but it's such a megalopolis that it's thought of as Cairo. So, this taxi picks us up. Seems like a nice enough guy. He's listening to some good music. And as he's crossing the bridge from Zaimlek into Giza, he misses the exit he's supposed to take to get on Corniche El Nil to get to Daki. My gut says, tell this guy to take the next exit, turn around, and take us home. I stupidly assumed he'd made a mistake and would do that. Nope. Suddenly he's taking the highway out of town towards October 6th city. I definitely do not know where we're going now. It's night, city lights are getting farther away. I have no clue where this guy is taking us, and I'm thinking that my sister is in the back what's gonna happen to her. I started arguing with the guy telling him to turn around, turn around, turn around. His excuse is that he doesn't know Giza. Bullshit. If you know how to get around the east side of the Nile then you know the immediate west side. He thinks I'm a clueless tourist, but by this point, a year and a half, I know Cairo fairly well. Basically, I became the biggest fool in my life to get him to turn around. He does and starts heading back into town. We get stuck in traffic. He puts the passenger side window up, I pull it back down. It's my way of saying that I'm in charge, even though the wind is biting my face and it's cold. I'm also positioning myself the best I can to start decking this guy if necessary. But I'm also trying to figure out how to get my sister out too. She is in the back seat behind the driver. Little do I know that she has taken off her kafia that she got in Jordan, wrapped it up in both hands and is planning, if necessary, to wrap it around his neck and choke the guy so we can make a getaway. Well eventually we get out of the traffic, the guy is driving way too fast, like well over 100 miles per hour. Eventually he gets to an exit, and I just tell him to stop which happens to be by a grocery store. I get out and yell at him. I'm ready to throw down now that we're in relative safety. You got a few Salafi guys who are just staring at us. My sister grabs me, and we just go inside the grocery store so we're actually safe. So, I don't know where this guy would have taken us, all I know is that it would have been out into the middle of nowhere. We were getting kidnapped, my sister getting ready to kill him saved our lives. We still talk about it, and that night we made protocols whenever we travel again to ensure our safety. My wife and I are hanging out with my sister and my sister's BF tonight. He's never heard the story, so it'll make for a good NYE tale. 46. One night when I was 10 we were at an away camp. The campsite had other groups there, but we had separate cabins for boys and girls where we were staying, obviously. One night me and the other boys decided to sneak over to the girls' cabin and bang on their windows to scare them. We waited till probably midnight, then sneaked on over making sure to not wake up counselors. We rounded the last corner of the cabin and standing at the window peeking in was a man in a white shirt, probably 30s. We were absolutely terrified it was a ghost or something, so we bolted terrified back to our cabins, we'd been telling our own scary stories. We never got caught leaving, and we never told our counselors because we thought we'd get in trouble for sneaking out. No clue what the guy was doing or would have done if we didn't happen upon him by chance. 47. This isn't extremely horrifying, but this was the first thing I thought of. It was Seder school last year and right before I went to practice I got pizza with my friend and one day we go in and we sit down at a table and notice that there are a small group of other guys there. One kid came up to us and asked to be our friend because he had just moved here from a different school so of course we said yes, and we all talked a little bit and he asked if he could sit down. We talked a little after that and we noticed that it was time to go so we walked back to the high school, it was almost right next to the pizza place and BTW the pizza place is in a small little area with about 4 other small stores. Practice is normal and we go home and then the next day we see him during our lunch period so of course we say hi. About a week passes of us saying hi to each other in the hallway and one day after school I decide to go home instead of getting pizza with my friend and I take a nap, because there's about 2-3 to three hours before practice since it's at 6 o'clock. I wake up to about 6 missed calls and over 50 missed messages from my friends, the cheer group chat, and from my coach. 
I pick up my phone because my coach is still calling me and I say, what's up what happened why is everyone freaking out? And she says that there was a stabbing at the place that me and my friend usually go to every day. I immediately froze and she asked me where my friend was, and I said that I didn't know because I wasn't with her. She told me to call my friend, so I did, and I frantically asked where she was and it turns out that she wasn't there so there was a wave of relief. I go to practice, and everyone is freaked out because of this and practice that day was extremely quiet because we had found out that a person in our school got stabbed. After practice I went home, and my mom told me the name of the kid that got stabbed and it was the boy that just came here from a different town. He passed away that night and for the next months the school was almost silent throughout the hallways. 48. When I was in college, back in 2013, once I had to fill some papers, you know, bureaucracy, but that day, a guy doing his service hours attended me and he got a crush on me. I didn't even see his face, I just signed what I had to sign and left, but he received my papers and got all my personal info. He stalked me for years, he knew where I lived, where I worked, my phone, my email, my college schedule, he knew everything. He texted me from different numbers, followed me in the campus, he even showed up at my job once, and he always claimed I was A-B asterisk TCH for not giving him a chance to make me the happiest girl alive in his own words. I had to speak to the college's principal and security made some kind of restriction order from him to stay away from me, and he was not allowed to enter the engineering school where I was studying. Three years later, he showed up in new job I got and said that he just moved to a new job on the same building and we could hang out someday. I spoke to my boss and he understood and talked to the building security manager. And this guy was, again, not allowed to be on the floor my office was, but he called me from a blocked number and yelled at me that I was ruining his life. I was so terrified that I quit that job. I haven't heard anything from him in two years and I hope to continue like this forever. Please never pressure anyone if they've already said no. 49. A few years ago, my sister dated this guy, I'll call Jack. He was a Navy vet who had been in combat. It was going alright, but she ended up finding out some stuff about him that led her to break up with him. When he left the Navy, he had PTSD and was heavily affected by it, though his behavior might have been from more than just his service. According to her, he was doing serious drugs behind her back, being mentally unstable, and he was severely depressed and suicidal. She didn't just leave though, she wanted to remain friends with him because she's good at helping people with things like that and being supportive. He's not a bad guy, he's just not doing okay mentally. Fast forward to sometime last winter, I got a call from my sister late at night while she was driving. She said Jack had gotten hold of a handgun and was having suicidal thoughts. She was driving to his apartment to have him give her the gun and wanted to let me know where she was going and when in case something happened, she lived three hours away from the time, too, so couldn't do anything involving my presence. She had her friend send me Jack's address and stay in touch as a second witness and she wanted me to check in every so often. At this point, my heart was racing, and I couldn't stop imagining everything that could go wrong. He was a pretty unstable guy, from what I'd heard so I had no idea what he would do, and my anxiety was only made worse by the fact that he apparently asked her to come over to take the gun away from him, which was ringing alarms in my head that it could be some sort of plan for something worse. Even if it wasn't, he had a gun and the intent to not live anymore which had me equally worried for the obvious outcome of him committing suicide. Jack opened the door, and fortunately, he literally had the gun ready by the front door and handed it to her immediately. She ended up talking to him for over an hour on the curb next to her car and ended up talking him out of it. The whole time, I was still so paranoid that I was even asking her random questions, only she'd know the answer to in case he was texting with her phone saying everything was fine which in hindsight was pretty excessive of me. In the end, everything was fine, she left with the gun, and I think he might have gotten professional help. The whole experience, I was absolutely terrified of what could happen to either of them or I just about had an iron grip on my phone the entire time. I think she might still talk to him, and I really hope he's doing better nowadays. 50. I wouldn't classify it as creepy, but definitely horrifying. 
Sometime overnight, my car was stolen and involved in a failure to stop incident. There was a chase involved, and the driver bailed. All while I'm sound asleep in my bed. The police found my abandoned car and ran to the plate. That led them to my home. I woke up to an officer, a gun pulled and pointed at me, and lots of yelling. There were two other police officers who had gone upstairs to do the same to my kids, who were around 12, 15, and 18 at the time. I truly had no idea WTF happened, but my kids and I were awakened harshly by police officers looking for a fleeing suspect of someone who stole my car. They had a description of the driver and were convinced that I had the suspect hidden in the home somewhere. They proceeded to call in the fire department to run heat signature tracing in the walls and attic to confirm that their suspect was not there. The good news is that my car was recovered, intact, and I was never arrested or cuffed. Just imagine waking to a 9mm pointed at you. Thanks for watching. Please comment, like, share and subscribe. The Internet Surfer on YouTube for more horror and scary stories.